Thank you for joining us for the East Mediterranean Business uh, Cultures Alliances, the legacy of the Treaty of Lausanne on its 100th anniversary panel discussion. My name is Luke Katzos, I'm Chris President, and I will be moderating today's panel. Our distinguished panel includes author and independent historical researcher, Stavros Stavridis, author and independent scholar, Nikos Nikoludis, uh, attorney, uh, John Papaspanos, and educate a community leader entrepreneur, Peter Stavranidis. The Treaty of Lausanne, uh, signed in, on July 24th, 1923, played a pivotal role in reshaping the political landscape of the Eastern Mediterranean. This treaty marked the end of hostilities between the Allies and the Ottoman Empire, and formally concluded World War I in the region. While it addressed numerous issues, its legacy continues to influence contemporary relations between Greece and Turkey, two key signatories. The treaty aimed to establish peaceful relations between Greece and Turkey, marking the end of hostilities after World War I, and the so-called incorrectly, in my opinion, Greco-Turkish War from 1919-1922. However, over the years, several contentious issues have strained and continue to strain their relationship. The Treaty of Lausanne is a historical document of great significance. It not only recognized the uh, Republic of Turkey as the successor state to the Ottoman Empire, but also delineated its borders and its centuries of imperial rule. One of its central provisions, the population exchange between Greece and Turkey, led to the mass displacement of over 1.5 million people fundamentally altering the demographic makeup of both nations. This exchange, while aimed per some to resolve ethnic tensions, left a legacy of unresolved issues, including the Christian genocide in the late Ottoman period, addressed in the earlier Treaty of Cervez and grievances over the affected populations. Although the Treaty of Lausanne is very clear that continue to be enduring territorial disputes in the Aegean Sea, resulting in ongoing disputes over sovereignty and resource uh, exploration between Greece and Turkey. With Turkey laying claim to certain islands, inlets, and the continental shelf, leading to frequent tensions, naval standoffs, and massive air airspace violations. This issue continues to remain a flashpoint up to this day, obviously, and continuing to their bilateral relations. More, moreover, the uh, issue of Cyprus continues to haunt the relationship between the two nations, leading to a complex and protracted conflict. The Turkish invasion of Cyprus in 1974 further strained relations, with the island remaining divided into the Republic of Cyprus in the south and the self-declared and not recognized, except for Turkey, Turkish Republic, of Northern Cyprus in the North. This unresolved issue continues to hinder regional stability in the East Mediterranean. Another contentious legacy uh, of the treaty is the uh, protection of minority rights. While the treaty guaranteed the rights of the Hellenic minority in Turkey and the Turkish minority in the Hellenic Republic, the Greek Orthodox min minority was ethnically cleansed over time after the, after the treaty in Turkey and issues of religious freedom education, and cultural preservation underscore the ongoing challenges of implementing the original provisions. Furthermore, the Treaty of Lausanne did not anticipate the complexities of the modern geopolitical landscape. The discovery of substantial hydrocarbon reserves in the Eastern Mediterranean has amplified regional competition and exacerbated tensions between Elas and Turkey as well as Cyprus with these nations asserting their rights to explore and exploit their resources, leading to disputes with neighboring countries and constant conflict, creating a web of disagreements. Conspiracy theory on the Treaty of Lausanne include claims in civil and formal circles in Turkey that the Treaty of Lausanne will expire this year in uh, 2023. 
According to the conspiracy theory, quote, Turkey is forbidden to mine its natural resources, such as boron and petroleum, due to, quote, secret articles of the treaty. Therefore, Turkey will rapidly become a developing com uh, country by mining and exporting the resources once the treaty expires, which, of course, is, it, it hasn't. The legacy of the treaty is also intertwined with broader issues such as nationalism and regional power dynamics. The influence of, the, of major international actors such as the United States, the European Union, and Russia adds another layer of complexity to the situation. We hope that this discussion contributes with others an ongoing serious bilateral diplomatic dialogue leading to a peaceful resolution to current tensions in the in the Eastern Mediterranean. Just for the audience, I'd like to I'd like to just uh, cite uh, the key provisions of the treaty. Uh, one of the key provisions has to do with border and uh, territorial adjustments. Another one has to do with the Straits, you know, the, uh, regarding the Bosphorus and, and the uh, Dardanelles Straits. Uh, another one has to do, obviously, with what we discussed before, which was the population exchange. We also discussed uh, religious minority rights. And then another thing had to do with uh, reparations and, and assets. Uh, we, are, we are, again, um, very grateful for the fantastic distinguished panelists that we have uh, uh, today that I that I mentioned earlier, and I'd like to introduce the first panelist for a, a short presentation, uh, and that's Stavros Terry Stavridis. Uh, Stavros uh, Stavridis was born in Cairo, Egypt, and migrated with his parents to Australia. He has also lived in the United States and holds a master's degree in history from the Royal uh, Melbourne Institute of Technology University. He has taught at the uh, university and community college levels, both in Australia and the U.S. Uh, Terry is the author of four books and five contributing chapters on Greek Turkish history, uh, uh, genocide, minorities, and historical fiction. Among his books includes The Tales from the Last Days of Anatolia, The Assyrians in Australian Documents, which he co-authored with, with uh, someone else. The Greek-Turkish uh, War, 1919 uh, 19 to 1923, and the Armenian Massacres, as reported in the Argus newspapers, 1894 to 98, again, uh, with, with, uh, co-authored with someone else. His research interests focus on the Balkan Wars, 1912 to 1913, Greece during the First World War, the Greek-Turkish War, 1919 to 1923, and wider Middle East history, which was which are based on primary sources from British, U.S., and Australian archives. He currently works as a freelance writer in the national for the National Herald in New York City, writing history and historical fiction. Thank you for joining us today, Stavro. Uh, thank you, Louis, for for the introduction. Uh, welcome to to all fellow panelists. Now, with the Treaty of Luzon, where do you start? There are so many issues that were broached for, for discussion. I will focus on, on a couple for, for the purpose of our, our contribution today. Firstly, I would look at the issue of the Patriarchio. In the first phase of the Luzon Conference, the, the Turks were quite insistent that the Patriarchio must be removed lock, stock and barrel from Constantinople and probably put somewhere on Mount Athos. During the discussions, uh, Izmit Pasha was very, very insistent that that must take place. But Venizelos cited historical issues like the church councils of the past and it couldn't be done. Uh, fortunately, the, the French being so pro-Turkish at the time said that, okay, the, the patriarch can remain in Constantinople, but one thing, his political powers must be removed, and it just may be purely a religious institution. Now, the reason why the Turks took a dislike to the patriarch at, at that time was because during the Greco-Turkish War of 1919-22, uh, patriarch Meletios was very much... Uh, a, against the Turkish uh, regime, especially against the, the Kemalist. And so, so they took a dislike to him. But they considered him uh, a traitor. But fortunately, after uh, 
d- discussion in the uh, about the issue. In the end, the the US, France, Britain, in the end said no, nope, it, it must remain there, and and so in the end it stayed there, shorn of its uh, political influence and just be a religious institution. And, of course, when we look at the minority rights in the Treaty of Lausanne, Articles 37 to 45, the issue of the patriarchy is not even stated, not even mentioned. So so in the end, it just remained there, and it's just been ever since. Uh, the, other, the other issue that I, I have a great interest in is the issue of reparations. The, the Turks were always insistent that Greece had to pay reparations for for damages during the course of uh, of that war. Now, one thing I'd like to state is that the Lausanne Conference was split into two periods. The first period was from November 1922 to early February 1923. And at that stage, they, they got very close to actually completing the negotiations and, and getting the treaty treaty and its instruments signed. But the French kept egging on the Turks to uh, to, to reject, to reject. So, so in the end, it stalled. And the, then the conference restarted again in April and in 1923 and finished in, in July uh, 1923 with the final signature and all the instruments that uh, make up that document. Now, during the, during, in May 1923, the, the the Turks were really quite insistent that as you must pay reparation, you must pay. But but Venizelos uh, told his mit in I'll oh, just put it in a very comical way, eh, his mit, we, we've got a huge refugee crisis on our hands. How can we pay you? We don't have any money. No, you must pay. So 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 his mit that contacted his masters in in Angora or Ankara as it was known then. <laughs> And and asked them, what what should I do? And the, and and Mustafa Kemal and his government said, no, they got to pay. In the end, Venezuela said, if if that's the way you are, we are going to abort the conference. And uh, and finally, a bit of common sense uh, prevailed, because the Greeks actually threatened to go to war over this. And when the Allies got a wind of that, it was. They sort of they shut it in their boots because that that meant that a, a new Greco-Turkish war would start over over reparations. So, so in the end, what uh, Venizelos offered them and they accepted it was was a small triangle of territory, a strategic railway around Karagach, uh, which is around Adrianopoli, uh, and that's also I think there's also a convention of uh, Karagach in the uh, as one of the instruments to, to the Treaty of Luzon. Now, uh, another issue that I have a keen interest in is the issue of Mosul. Now, the the British wanted Mosul obviously for the oil, and it formed part of the part of their imperial communications uh, through through the Middle East uh, onto their Indian uh, sub empire. Now, during during the discussions, uh, 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 what's his name, the Turks. Uh, produced all sorts of uh, things like the historical population, economic reasons why it should remain in Turkey. But but the British argued, said, no, 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 no. This, this belongs to Mesopotamia, or of course it became known as Iraq. It must remain like that. And that issue was not resolved until 1926, when, uh, when the League of Nations finally uh, worked out the boundaries of what became between uh, Iraq and uh, Turkey. Uh, there are there are so many issues I, I could actually talk about this uh, period, but uh, I'd like to also throw in an Australian perspective. When when I was doing my my master's uh, dissertation, uh, and I did my Greco-Turkish war from the eyes of two Melbourne newspapers, the Argus, which is now obsolete. And and the age, which is still going strong today. In um, in 1923, in January 1923, uh, Ismit Pasha during the discussions uh, talked about the Anzac Greys, because for Australia, Gallipoli and the and the Dardanelles have a great significance here. 
because uh, as Australia's first entry into World War One was fighting the Ottoman Turks uh, on the Gallipoli Peninsula. Now, during uh, during 1923, the uh, the Turks actually said that they were going to dig up the uh, the Anzac graves, and uh, and of course the the then Australian Prime Minister uh, Billy Hughes said that if you do that, that is a causes but belly. And, of course, Lord Curzon, who was the uh, British Foreign Secretary, backed Australia. And at that stage, the, the Australia and New Zealand were prepared to go to war over this. But, but finally, common sense uh, prevailed and the Turks actually uh, backed off. Now, after the signing of the treaty in uh, 1923, uh, in October of that year, 1923, the Australian Prime Minister, the new Prime Minister, Stanley Bruce, uh, visited uh, London for the Imperial Conference, where they discussed all the things that affected the British Empire. And, of course, the, the, the Luzon Treaty was also discussed there as well. And on his way back in early 1924, he actually stopped off at the Anzac uh, cemeteries uh, on the peninsula at Gallipoli and also visited... At Constantinople. So I, I believe that, that through my research that Stanley Bruce was probably the first Western leader to visit the new Turkish state uh, at that time. Now, he, he later became known as Lord uh, uh, Melbourne Br uh, of Bruce, and he also represented Australia at, at the League of Nations uh, 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 in discussions that, that affected Australia's interest at, at that time. Uh, another area which, which I've been doing some research, and, and unfortunately I can't get access to the Greek Foreign Ministry archives, unfortunately at the time, because their website isn't working, uh, I, I wrote a chapter uh, in a book called New Perspectives on, I think, Modern Greek History, and, and I wrote about the Greek POWs and interned civilians from 1922 to 1929. Uh, it's about 22, 25,000 words in, in length. And and the horrible things that the uh, Greek POWs suffered during the period of discussion at Luzon and beyond were, is really horrific. Uh, and, of course, uh, in April of 1923, Trikoupis, who was the last commander-in-chief of the Greek army in Asia Minor, came back uh, not impressed. And and a lot of and a lot of the Greek soldiers who came along with him as part of the first exchange uh, looked very emaciated. They looked like skeletons with just uh, with just, uh, with just a bit of skin on them. Uh, and and also the the issue of uh, what we call about exchange of populations, compulsory exchange of cop. I think that's really a misnomer because the great majority of the Greeks had already left were kicked out of Turkey in September, October 1922. And uh, and, and the only ones that uh, came after that were, I think the last lot of Greeks that came uh, to, to Greece uh, from Asia Minor was in 1924. But, but generally speaking, uh, the, the Treaty of Luzon is not, has no date on it, as the Turks uh, suggest. And... And one of the things that I'd like to uh, su suggest also to is that there is no real definitive history being written on the Luzon Conference, as far as I know, like the Paris Conference of 1919, like uh, Margaret that Macmillan wrote the Paris 1919. And uh, she happens to be the granddaughter of uh, uh, whom I consider the great British Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, uh, pro-Greek. Um, and uh, finally, well, what I'd like to say is that I, I do dabble now in historical fiction. And the reason why I do that is, is to try and make history a little bit more interesting for the ordinary folk. Because generally speaking, from what I see, uh, there's the ordinary person is really not really interested in, in reading academic history. So I thought that trying to create fictional characters and place them in, in real events I thought that would be, you know, an interesting way. And uh, I think Louis mentioned uh, one of the, the book that I had, uh, which is a collection of fictional short stories. It's called Tales from the Last Days of Anatolia. Well, I'd like to uh, inform you is that the book is being revised with additional short stories, and hopefully it will be released uh, before uh, Christmas 
in, in the US. Uh, such. So that's all I have to add about the Treaty of Lausanne. So hopefully, hopefully we, we could get maybe a, a group of us to, to sit down and maybe work out and, uh, and even bring in some Turks as well to, to actually write uh, the, the history because we can't be accused that we can't be all Greek because they've got their own point of view that we need to consider as well. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, Stavro, thank you. Thank you uh, so much for that. Uh, for the audience, uh, the, the treaty, you can go on the Internet and get the whole treaty, by the way. Uh, it was originally written in uh, French, which was the diplomatic language, but it's also translated into English. So a simple, a simple uh, a prompt on the uh, on the Internet. You can you can easily get it. There's about 143 articles, 143 articles relating to the particular treaty. Stavro mentioned some some of the points, by the way, uh, in the treaty itself. And, and the cemetery issue may sound like, uh, oh, is that mentioned in a treaty? It is mentioned in a treaty very specifically. Um, so it, it makes for very, very interesting uh, reading. Also reparations, what, what Stavro discussed in terms of reparations and things, that's also obviously uh, mentioned, mentioned in a treaty. Stavro is, is coming for, uh, uh, to us from Melbourne right now. So we thank you, Stavro, for uh, you know getting up real, real early uh, for this fascinating discussion on a on a treaty. The other thing you mentioned, Stavros, which I thought was very was very interesting, and and um, it, it requires, I think, another discussion. But the discussion leading up to leading up to the treaty, because in fact we talk we talk about uh, you know uh, uh, one one part of, of the uh, signatories, let's say, and the other part. Okay, the one part being being the British Empire at the time, France, Italy, Japan, Greece, Romania, uh, Serb, uh, Croat, uh, Slovene state. That's one part. And then Turkey being being the other part. But the one part was not necessarily united, Stavro. And, and you mentioned that, basically. Uh, you mentioned the French, for example. Uh, the French were problematic in the so-called, uh, you know, Greco-Turkish War. You know, who did they support? They, they, they certainly didn't support the Hellenic state. And, and the reason why I say the so-called war is, is because Ismini Lam and uh, Chris Lam had written a book also on Horton, where they basically bring up the point that, in fact, the fact the forces were not there, uh, you know, because they wanted to necessarily go in there. But in fact, World War I was not over. OK, the treaty, the treaty was the last aspect of the closure of World War I not 1918, but rather 1923. Stavra, thank you, and we'll come back, obviously, when we have the more general discussion. Our next presenter is uh, independent uh, scholar and author, Nikos Nikoludis. Uh, he obtained his PhD uh, in, in the Department of Byzantine and Modern Studies at King's College in London. He is the organizer of three one-day conferences, a participant in two research programs, and, and 17 history conferences, and has authored um, or co-authored also 14 history books and many articles. He, is, he was the editor-in-chief of Historia Themata, uh, Historic Themes, a monthly Greek historical journal. Nico is the uh, editor of five collective volumes, including a dictionary on the Byzantine uh, Peloponnese in the Hellenic, the, the 12th volume of, uh, of journal Mesoyos under the uh, title uh, Byzance with studies of the Byzantine Empire and to Mikrasatiko Zitima Metamatia ton Xenon, the question of Asia Minor in the eyes of foreigners, written in, uh, in Athens in uh, this, this year, actually. His areas of research interest includes geographical, military, and socio-political uh, history of uh, the Hellenic Republic, Southeast, uh, Southeastern Europe, and the Middle East. Welcome, Nico, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you for your invitation, Lou. Um, actually, <clears throat> what Savro said was very interesting, but um, I will try and catch the thread of the story, if you like, uh, a little bit earlier. Uh, and uh, try and focus on two issues from the Greek point of view, which uh, play, had a significant uh, uh, part in the formation of the Treaty of Lausanne. The first is the participation of Eleutherios Venizelos, not just as a representative of Greece in the Conference of Lausanne, but 
as a mastermind behind all the diplomatic um, and political effort of Greece to the point of Lausanne, which uh, uh, terminated uh, his efforts. And also, uh, parallel to that, the uh, concept of the Megali there, or the great idea, which was the Greek um, uh, irredentism, if you like, uh, ever since the formation of the Greek state in 1830, and how that was terminated in Lausanne, uh, again, through Venizelos, um, as a matter of fact. So, Briefly speaking, the Megali there uh, <clears throat> uh, arose as such f after the fall of Constantinople in 1453, but its official expression was uh, only uh, only appeared in 1844 by uh, through a speech of Ioannis Coletis, the then Prime Minister, uh, in the National Assembly when the <clears throat> people there were discussing the formation of the first Greek constitution after the liberation of the Greek state. So, uh, in that context, uh, during the 19th century, Greeks, Greek, Greece, the state of Greece, managed to expand uh, somewhat in cases where it was in harmony with the wishes of the great powers of the time. And we have two incidences of that. In 1864, when the Ionian Islands were handed over to Greece from Great Britain. And secondly, in 1881, following the Congress of Berlin, when Thessaly and the region of Arta were handed over to Greece uh, in the context of keeping a balance between the Balkan states um, at the time. On the other hand, there were great setbacks during the same period when Greeks tried to achieve what they wanted, the completion of the great uh, idea, against the wishes of the great powers. And the two most prominent examples of that was the so-called Great Cretan Revolution of 1866, which was a, a great manifestation of uh, uh, Cretan resilience, but unfortunately didn't lead to anywhere. And the disastrous Greco-Turkish War of uh, 1897. So in the late 19th century, uh, Greece had to confront two uh, powers, local powers, in the effort to accomplish the great idea. One was uh, the, the newest one, and the most dangerous at the time, was the newly independent uh, Bulgarian state, which claimed ethnically mixed uh, Balkan regions, including uh, strong numbers of Greeks, such as Macedonia and Thrace. And the other, of course, was the Ottoman Empire, which was the traditional great power of the region, but in the state of uh, collapse. So this is a period when Venizelos comes to uh, the political scene in Greece. In 1910, he becomes a prime minister. And although he's essentially a pacifist and uh, a modernist, if you like, he his model was Harilos Trikoupis, the great uh, uh, modernizer, um, prime minister of uh, Greece, who tried to build up the infrastructure of the country. He had, uh, Venizelos, on the other hand, despite his uh, uh, pacifist and modernizing uh, uh, ideas, had to immediately face a set of circumstances which would lead up to a series of wars. Uh, with the Balkans ready to explode during the Balkan Wars, and immediately afterwards, as we know, in 1914, the beginning of the First World War. So, uh, during the period of 1912 and to 23, he had to participate in a series of uh, conferences or international meetings, bilateral or multilateral, uh, where he had to defend or promote the Greek rights in sets of circumstances which were rarely favorable, I would say, for Greek uh, issues. And in that context, he often had to act more as a foreign minister of Greece uh, rather than a prime minister as such. Uh, his main um, <clears throat> um, uh, personal uh, uh, facts, if you like, uh, which promoted his cause in a better way, or his the fact that he conducted the personal diplomacy, he was a realist and he was also flexible. Uh, and these uh, features were con contributed significantly to the success of his uh, uh, tasks. One example, uh, in 1912, just before the 
uh, beginning of the First Balkan War, when the Balkan alliance had been formed between Serbia and, and uh, Bulgaria, Venizelos intervened and tried to become a member of the alliance without really asking for any uh, benefits from the other allies, uh, despite the fact that they had already decided between them which territories were going to annex after the end of the war. So Venizelos said, okay, I'm not claiming any territory and let me just... Uh, let just Greece join the struggle and uh, see where it goes. And in this case, he managed, uh, he, Greece, of course, liberated the Macedonia uh, and took um, the greatest part of it without uh, uh, having any previous uh, arrangement. The reason why he did that is because otherwise Bulgarians would react and the, the whole alliance would be undermined and probably Greece would be left out. So he took the risk, but it... Uh, came out. The second example, just a few months later, during the conference of Bucharest, which terminated the Second Balkan War, uh, Venizelos avoided to claim territories which had already been liberated by the uh, Greek army, and those were territories east of the Nestos River, such as uh, uh, the Deagach, present Alexandrupoli, by naval contingents, and uh, part of Western Thrace. The reason being against that uh, again that he wanted to avoid the further confrontation of, with Bulgaria and perhaps the great powers, since Bulgaria at the time was adamant in having access to the Aegean. So uh, what he wanted and gained in the end was uh, to annex um, Eastern Macedonia with the prosperous cities, uh, city of Kavala, and that he accomplished. This was also the time, on the other hand, when Following the disastrous uh, outcome of the Balkan Wars for Turkey, the Greek genocide in Turkey starts taking place. Um, it's interesting to note that uh, the first one of the first known incidents of such genocide was the destruction of the coastal city of Phokia, uh, just opposite Chios, on the 12th of June 1914. And I mention this because it took place after the end of hostilities between um, the Balkan countries and Turkey, and before the beginning of the First World War in August 1914, uh, even more so before the entrance of the Ottoman Empire in the First World War, which took place in November 1914. Uh, despite that uh, event, which was recorded uh, by quite a few foreigners at the time, both photographically and uh, as uh, dispatches to newspapers, Venizelos was determined to come to um, some kind of uh, arrangement with the Turkish uh, government. And on the 21st of July, 1914, he was on his way to Brussels to meet the uh, Ottoman Grand Vizier to discuss the termination, the official termination of Greek uh, Ottoman hostilities. But that didn't take place because during this journey, the uh, ultim ultimatum which Austria-Hungary handed over to Serbia and which um, started really the First World War, uh, had been handed. So it was obvious that hostilities were going to start any day. Uh, so this first effort to uh, for a Greco-Turkish understanding failed because of the beginning of the First World War. I won't go into the details of the Greek participation in the First World War. I'll just mention that at the end of it, in 1918, Greece had already 10 divisions on the Macedonian front, which proved uh, uh, critical in the uh, uh, termination of hostilities in that front and eventually termination of hostilities in other fronts of the First World War. Uh, but it's important at that stage to note that soon after the hostilities, which uh, we commemorated yesterday on the 11th of November, uh, <clears throat> in the Western Front, uh, Venizelos was, had already prepared a memorandum which he submitted on the 30th of uh, December of 1918, the last day, the one, the day before the last of the end of the year, 1918, uh, to the great powers as a basis of the Greek uh, demands in the peace conference which was going to take place in Paris. And in that, he claimed for Greece uh, the following regions, Northern Epirus, Thrace, Constantinople, 
Asia Minor, including Smyrna, and the Dodecanese, which were temporarily, supposedly at the time, under Italian control. Um, the interesting detail of that memorandum, which hasn't been really noticed by most historians, even up to this day, is that uh, at the, near the end of the text, Venizelos made the specific mention of how he viewed the fate of Greeks living in Turkey at the time, if Greece managed to have a foothold, foothold in Turkey. And uh, he said the following, uh, I've translated it uh, from the original. He said that under the peace treaty, the Turkish government would be obliged to uh, buy the land of, and the landed property of Greeks living in its territory, talking about Asia Minor, of course, and wishing to migrate to Greek, to Greek Asia Minor, the Greek zone that would be established, hopefully, at that time in uh, Western Asia Minor. The Greek government will do the same with the land property of Ottomans wishing to migrate to Turkish Asia Minor, meaning the Turkish, the remaining Turkish territory in the uh, whole of Asia Minor. Thus, a flow of mutual and voluntary immigration would take place with the hopeful outcome that in the space of a few years, the population of the Turkish state will uh, consist almost exclusively by Muslims. So, uh, he had the foresight to imagine um, a voluntary, at that point, exchange of populations within uh, the context of Turkey, the Asia Minor, the region of Asia Minor. Uh, of course, we know that uh, it didn't happen uh, that way, but uh, I'm saying it because it shows that he wasn't completely unprepared for the eventuality of the exchange of population. So, uh, moving on to the actual peace conference in 1919-20, I mean the Paris um, peace conference, um, it's important to know that Venizelos uh, established a very good personal rapport with most uh, key political figures and diplomats of the conference. Uh, to mention just the most important one, one of them was the British uh, Prime Minister David Lloyd George, who called Venizelos a big man, a very big man. The American President Woodrow Wilson, who also called Venizelos at some point the biggest man I met. Uh, Lord Morris Hankey, who was the secretary to the British cabinet, again calling Venizelos a big man. You see how they all viewed him as a bigger than life person in the conference. And finally, uh, the distinguished British diplomat Harold Nicholson, who was also to meet Venizelos in the Lausanne conference, calling him overwhelmingly frank, genial, and subtle. Um, on the other hand, Venizelos managed to promote the Greek cause by offering Greek support to issues that other big countries, uh, big great powers had um, at the table. For example, uh, the US President Wilson was uh, interested in the formation of the, Greek, uh, the League of Nations. Venizelos became an adamant supporter to that cause, so much so that uh, uh, at a later stage, before the termination of the Paris Peace Conference, he was offered the uh, chancellorship, which would have been uh, what we would call today in the context of the UN, the, um, play, the Office of the General Secretary of the League of Nations, but he refused it because he wanted to dedicate himself to the completion of his... Uh, uh, of the... Of, um, Greek uh, 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 aims. To the French, he offered, uh, as we know, the participation of uh, Greek troops in uh, southern Russia on the side of the French troops fighting the Bolsheviks who were advancing at the time all over the place. And to the British, of course, he offered an alliance for the control of the defeated Ottoman Empire. Um, <clears throat> so, in that context, Greece as we know, gained the uh, one major advantage in the first place, the landing of a uh, Greek armed force in Smyrna uh, with the support of uh, contingents of Italy and um, Great Britain, which would act as a police force in the Sanjak of Smyrna, the administrative, uh, wider administrative ter ter territory. And that happened, as we know, on the 15th of May 1919 in the new style. Uh, calendar. The other 
major uh, victory was the concession of Western Thrace from Bulgaria through the Treaty of Neji in uh, late in November 1919. That uh, area was uh, ceded uh, originally to the Antant and then handed over to Greece through the during the San Remo conference, which took place in late April 1920. And the biggest achievement, of course, was the Treaty of Sever, uh, signed on the 10th of August in 1920, in the course of which Turkey conceded to Greece the whole of the Sanjak was, uh, was Myrna, eastern Thrace, and the islands of Imbros and Tenedos in the Aegean, plus the islands of the Sea of Marmara. All that was very good, and as we know, it didn't last, because in August and September of 1922, the whole of uh, uh, Ionia uh, and the was destroyed, and the Greek populations were either massacred or forced to abandon the area and uh, move to um, the Greek islands. During that period, uh, as we also know, Venizelos was not in power. He had lost power in uh, late in 1920 through the election, and he was living uh, in exile as a private citizen in France. But uh, despite his uh, uh, lack of uh, official status, he had uh, private contacts during this period with uh, important persons, um, politicians of the time, uh, trying to influence, to whatever extent he could, uh, the circumstances to the favor of Greece. So we know that uh, in um, autumn 1922, before the beginning of Lausanne, he, he, the Conference of Lausanne, he managed to convince the then Turkish, sorry, uh, pro-Turkish French Prime Minister, Raymond Poincaré, uh, to stop the Turks uh, from crossing uh, from Eastern Thrace to Western Thrace. Eastern Thrace had already had been handed de facto to uh, the Turks without being um, officially acknowledged as such, but uh, the issue was far from over, as we know, and uh, the Turks were demanding more and more. Um, in this um, set of circumstances, he was assigned on the 21st of uh, September uh, by the new newly established revolutionary Greek government, the post of the official representative of Greece in the forthcoming uh, a conference of uh, Lausanne, which was about to start in uh, November. Um, again, and that uh, reach, uh, takes us to the climax of his uh, uh, diplomatic uh, activities of the period, um, when he uh, had to uh, confront a multitude of issues uh, in which Greece was uh, already uh, in a bad uh, place to negotiate. That was, first of all, the final status of the islands of the Aegean, the central and northern Aegean islands. Also, the, to the, he had to settle the Greek-Turkish uh, border in Thrace, which, as I said, was anything but determined. Uh, also, the, another issue was the exchange of populations, the protection of minorities, and finally, the thorniest issue of all, the war compensations demanded by Turkey. Uh, and then again, what saved to some extent the day was his high prestige uh, among foreign politicians. In that case, uh, he had to deal at least in the early stages of uh, the conference with two old acquaintances, the first being uh, Pre uh, Premier Poincaré of France, who, however, did not participate in the actual works of the conference. He left after the first day. Uh, Lord Curzon, the uh, British Foreign Secretary, who was presiding over the conference for most of the period, and, of course, his old acquaintance, Harold Nicholson, the British diplomat. On the other hand, this didn't mean so much because most diplomats, despite their respect uh, for him, all uh, foreign diplomats, I mean, uh, had... Uh, had to consider the their own country's interests, and they were very much different from what Greece wished. Um, I have to point out here again that the Turkish attitude throughout at least the first um, stage of the conference, uh, which lasted from November till uh, late January 1924, 
uh, was uh, a maximalist and indecisive. The Turks wanted everything, but uh, at the same time, they avoided closing any issue. They kept protracting the discussions, pushing in the, you know, in the oriental style of uh, bargaining uh, without uh, coming to a deal. And that led to the abrupt uh, termination of the conference, as we know, on the 30th uh, of January, which lasted for 75 days, this uh, uh, breakup. Um, before that, Venizelos had been concerned, uh, cornered rather, by, by uh, his uh, counterparts in the conference, but managed to manipulate the situation at, at least as far as the population exchange issue was concerned, by uh, forcing a solution which at first sight uh, seemed detrimental to Greece. That is the uh, compulsory uh, status of the exchange of population. Every type of exchange of population that had taken up to that point, not between Greece and Turkey, but throughout any international arrangement had had the voluntary character. This was the first time that uh, um, a conference had decided on uh, the compulsory status of the population exchange. This seemed very harsh, of course, to the Greek uh, people at the time, but uh, from Venizelos' point of view, uh, it was necessary for one simple reason. If there was no agreement, formal agreement, uh, on this issue, which would formalize the necessity of the uh, popul population exchange, Turkey would have a free hand to complete it at its own uh, leisure, uh, not by just forcing out the Ionian Greek populations, but also other Greek populations living in the hinterland of Turkey, like the Pontians, the ones in Cappadocia, and so on. Plus, uh, and eventually, the turn of uh, Greeks in Constantinople and the Patriarchate would uh, be in uh, the hands of Turkey. Uh, so what Venizelos did was to persuade the uh, negotiator of uh, the League of Nations for this issue of uh, population exchange, the Norwegian Fridjof Nansen, who was the High Commissioner and, and uh, was negotiating with the Turks in Constantinople, to uh, accept or propose rather, but without mentioning that it was Venizelos' idea, this compulsory uh, exchange of population. And that was what eventually took place with the signing of the Convention for the Exchange of Populations right at the end of the first uh, phase of the Lausanne Treaty on you know, the 31st of January, 1923. Uh, with, in that context, Venizelos secured the peaceful departure of approximately 300,000 remaining Greeks in Turkey, uh, the protection, as I mentioned, of the Ecumenical Patriarchate as an institution based in Constantinople, and the protected continuity of the livelihood of Greece in Constantinople, plus the islands of Imbros and Tenedos, uh, in exchange, of course, uh, for the uh, Muslims uh, living in Western Thrace who would stay uh, in their places of uh, uh, where, they where they lived without having to forcefully be uh, expelled like Muslims in Macedonia, for example. During the second and last phase of the conference, which lasted from the 23rd of April until the 24th of July, when, uh, 1923, when the treaty was finally signed, Venizelos established a very good personal rapport with Ismet Pasha, his main opponent in the conference, uh, and leader of the Turkish delegation. Surprisingly so, we may say, because Ismet was not a diplomat, he was a uh, uh, general, and he was uh, the one who actually beat the Turkish, the Greek troops in uh, the final battle uh, of the struggle in Asia Minor. Uh, but he impressed him so much so that uh, he even managed to invite him for dinner at his residence in Lausanne, which of course Ismet had to um, deny for reasons of appearance, as we understand. Finally, uh, at the end of the uh, whole conference, Venizelos again managed to successfully blackmail, we can say, uh, Ismet to accept the concession of the Treaty of uh, uh, Karagach 
uh, which is the only uh, suburb of Adrianople west of uh, uh, River Evros, uh, and actually uh, was largely inhabited by Greeks at the time. Incidentally, it was also the place of origin of my, of my paternal grandfather. So uh, this was the exchange that Venizelos offered to the Turks for dropping the uh, continuous demand for Greek uh, war reparations. As uh, Mr. Savridis mentioned before, Greece was in no uh, condition to offer any reparation because um, the uh, termination of hostilities had meant that, uh, and the arrival of refugees had meant that uh, Greece was bankrupt, essentially. Um, but on the other hand, an asset that Greece had at the time and the, Greek, the Turks had to consider was that under General Pangalos, the Greek army had reorganized in uh, west of Hebrus and was ready to uh, start new hostilities if the conference didn't uh, come to uh, result. So um, the pressure that Venizelos uh, placed in uh, this, incident, in this uh, set of circumstances worked because it was not only the great powers like France and uh, Britain that didn't want any more hostilities. Uh, it was also other sides that came out in, uh, on Venizelos' uh, side, like the Yugoslav ambassador at the conference called Jovanovic, who also threatened uh, with Turkey with war on behalf of Yugoslavia, and also secretly, but we know it now, the Soviet uh, foreign minister who was present at the conference, Mr. Ticherin, and I may I remind here that uh, the Soviet Union was allied essentially with Turkey at the time, also pressed for uh, the signing of the peace treaty because the Soviet Union didn't want uh, new hostilities which would bring up back the allies in the Straits territory. Uh, that would otherwise remain open as it did eventually to all uh, peacekeeping powers. Uh, of course, despite the fact that uh, the Treaty of Lausanne saved the day in a sense for Greece, we know that not all issues was, were finalized at the time and uh, it took Venizelos a few more years until 1930 uh, to uh, uh, finalize this um, uh, cordial uh, arrangement with Turkey by going to Ankara and signing there the final uh, treaty of Ankara with uh, Mustafa Kemal. So I'll close my uh, presentation here, ho hoping that I haven't uh, uh, bothered you too much with the uh, details. No, 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 Nico, you didn't bother, you didn't bother us at all. Uh, small question for you, uh, for us and the audience. Uh, you mentioned the memorandum that was written by uh, Venizelos. How do we get a, a copy of that? How do we, what research has been done on that? Is it on the internet or not? Not to my knowledge. I am aware of it because I have uh, four volumes of Venizelos' uh, documents that have been published by the uh, uh, Leski Philelefero in, in Athens many years ago. And the, the whole uh, memorandum is published there. Um, uh, this is just a small extract, but uh, if anyone is interested, uh, and I think you might have noticed, uh, Lou, it's mm. uh, reprinted partially, including this uh, bit, in the collective volume which has just come out and which I uh, edited and uh, I've also contributed to, uh, the Asia Minor question uh, in the eyes of foreigners. Of course, mm. it's in Greek again, but uh, uh, <laughs> it's the only place as far as I know that uh, one can find it uh, recently without having to dig in, you know, old bibliography and uh, uh, all that. Okay, well, we'll come back to that in a general discussion. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Nico. Our thank next uh, our next presenter is John uh, Papaspanos. Uh, he is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania Law School and a former uh, Fulbright scholar in Thessaloniki, Greece. He is currently a partner in the project finance group of the international law firm of Baker Butts, LLP, at their law office in uh, New York City. John represents private equity firms, sponsors, developers, public and private companies, lenders, and equity investors on the complex and novel project finance and other transactions, mainly in the energy sector. 
He is a board member of the Hellenic American Chamber of Commerce and the Hellenic Lawyers Association. Welcome, John, and thank you for being with us today. Thanks so much, Lou, for having me. Um, and that was such a robust background and context that Professor uh, Nicol Nicolidis uh, provided us that I'm going to try to keep the, the background aspects of my remarks pretty brief. I'm going, only going to highlight certain the um, prominent uh, developments that lead up to uh, the Treaty of Lausanne, just to have a basis for understanding um, what was going on in the time um, on the ground in terms of the factual realities. So the first, obviously, is the, um, the 1453 fall of Constantinople. That was the capital of the Byzantine Empire. And this, um, this catastrophe became a historical trauma that resonates to Greek um, in, in the Greeks' public uh, collective conscious even to this day. And from there, we had 400 years of um, Ottoman rule in Greece. And in 1821, as we all know, the Greeks revolted and established the modern Greek state in 1830. And then in the late 19th century, as uh, Professor mentioned, uh, we had this idea of the Megali idea, the great idea, by which Greece could somehow reconquer Istanbul and resurrect the Byzantine Empire. And fueled by this grand, um, ambitious idea, Greece attacked the Ottoman Empire in 1897. There they uh, suffered a stinging defeat. And then, the, however, the tables did turn eventually in the Balkan Wars in 1913 when Greece annexed the regions of Macedonia, Epirus, and Eastern uh, Thraki. And then World War I um, erupted. That was from 1914 to 1918. And the Allies included Serbia, Russia, France, Britain, Italy, and the US. And they were opposed by the Central Powers, which uh, consisted, consisted of Germany, Austria, Hungary, Bulgaria, and the Ottoman Empire. And the result of that great war was the fall of four great imperial dynasties. So it was the Germans, um, Austria-Hungary, uh, the Ottoman Empire, and then Russia fell um, victim to the Bolshevik Revolution, right? So the Tsar Nicholas uh, fell. So after all this chaos, we had a series of peace treaties where the victorious allies imposed punitive peace terms to the three great empires that participated in the war and lost, right? And the Treaty of Lausanne was the last of those peace treaties and it's the one that uh, still exists today, the only one that exists today. There is a little nuance and a, a wrinkle that I, I want to mention a little bit about the predecessor treaty, the Treaty of Severus, and that was entered into in August of 1920. That was uh, the initial treaty that was entered into between the victorious allied powers of World War I and the Ottoman Empire. And that's where the city of Smyrna actually was assigned to Greece. Uh, Smyrna was a very liberal cosmopolitan sit trading city with a huge Greek community. And well, even before the Treaty of Severus, there was even another development I didn't mention earlier, the San Remo Conference. And there um, we had Britain and France divvy up the territories of the Ottoman Empire um, south of Turkey. And Britain was actually granted the mandate of Palestine at that time, April 1920. And then it was approved by the League of Nations, which is really relevant today. Anyway, going back to the Treaty of Severus, Severus in 1920, um, later on in that year, that, the, the Treaty of Severus was signed in August. And I think October of that year, of 1920, Eleutherios uh, Venizelos commanded the Greek army and um, fueled by the Megalia there and some support from Phil Hellenes, like the, the British Prime Minister, he tried to fight um, in Anatolia and try to attack Ankara and he, he failed. And Mustafa Kemal Ataturk was the leader of the Turkish troops, surrounded the Greek army and forced the Greeks to flee. And Smyrna, as we all know, the, this, the great catastrophe was uh, put in flames with heavy loss of life. And then in 1921 to 1922, there was the Greco-Turkish War when Greece had to surrender uh, Smyrna, Eastern Thrace, and including Adrianopoli. That leads us to the Treaty of Lausanne in 1923. July 1923 was when it was signed in uh, Lausanne, Switzerland. There, the signatories were the Allied powers, the victors of World War I, and then Turkey, which was the successor state to the Ottoman Empire. So it was a little bit of an awkward situation because we have the victors of World War I on one side of the table and the losers of World War I. However, those allies just lost military battles in the interim. In that two year short period, the allies tried 
um, engage in skirmishes with Turkey and Ataturk was winning on the ground. So they were negotiating against the loser of World War One, but at the same time, the Turks had a great negotiation um, bargaining power because they were winning on, on, on the um, war front. And, and that um, resulted in Turkey getting most of what they wanted in the negotiations. So I wanna make a few quick comments on some of the other um, commentary that we've heard so far. Regarding reparations, it's important to note, not only did um, Greece successfully uh, negotiate to not give reparations to Turkey, but imp importantly, likewise, Turkey was not obligated to pay any reparations uh, to the Allied powers for World War I or otherwise. So that's one note. The other note is just to take a quick step back, looking at this treaty at a fundamental level, what is it? It's essentially the birth certificate for Turkey, modern day Turkey. You recognize the boundaries of the modern state of Turkey. It created the political and economic autonomy of Turkey. And for example, Turkey's share of the Ottoman Empire's debt was dramatically reduced. And Turkey has no claims over the oil rich Arab provinces um, in the former Ottoman Empire, which was a really important negotiation point for um, Britain and France. And then also um, uh, Turkey recognized the British possession of Cyprus and the Italian possession of the Vicanese. So basically it lays out the geopolitical framework of the Eastern Mediterranean and it created um, a lasting peace until today. Uh, there's more to come on that point later. But just to go through two very quick uh, topics, the treatment of minority populations and the, uh, the idea of self-determination, the Wilsonian concept. So first, the treatment of minorities. The treaty regulated rights of minorities, which is defined as non-Muslims living in Turkey. To understand minorities in Turkey today, you have to understand the Treaty of Lausanne and how it came to be. But the treaty, um, obviously we talked about it a few times, the treaty is known for having this massive compulsory population exchange around in the 1920s. I think it was around 2 million people had to relocate. So the Muslims in Greece uh, moved to Anatolia and vice versa. The Greeks in Anatolia went to um, Greece. So the question is, the overarching legacy of the Treaty of Lausanne is how should governments govern people whose identities do not fit with the historically dominant group's identity. So in Turkey, where you have the dominant group is the Turkish Muslim group, how do we govern in the context where the minorities are Christian, minorities are Greek, or maybe Armenian? Do they have representation in the government? Do they have equal rights? Do they have anti-discrimination protections? These are the same type of themes that we see very often, even to this day, very relevantly um, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's a very good case study to see how did they handle this so many years ago, 100 years ago? How did the, the signatories of the Treaty of Lausanne, the international law, uh, legal system at the time, and, and, the, and the major powers, how did they face this issue? And um, while the, I think an overarching conclusion is while the treaty did guarantee certain rights for all the populations, it, it was a failure in terms of delivering what we call a modern pluralist society in which there's a heterogeneous uh, group of people that live together, coexist, and they have um, common representation in the government. And that's a lasting part of the Treaty of Lausanne's legacy, that we have homogeneity in Greece, in Turkey, and um, the consequences of that to this day. So the international law consequences of having this population exchange, uh, by the way, is that it becomes a potential option it's a potential solution to a very complex and difficult problem. How do we have heterogeneous societies? So, for example, um, it was an antecedent to the partition of India and, and Pakistan. This is what they looked at and said this was an option in, um, you know, in, in the Eastern Mediterranean. And there was population mixing in India and Pakistan. They said we should separate the two. That was one policy that they enacted, at least partly based on um, what they viewed as the success of the Treaty of Lausanne. However, over the past few decades, I think we revisited this concept of uh, unmixing, this concept of peacemaking through forcibly changing the location of the ethnic groups and the religious groups so they're concentrated with other people of the same group. 
And now many people can even characterize this as ethnic cleansing, right? Which is, um, which is a concept that's related to genocide. And with that, let's, let's turn now to the other major theme of self-determination, especially for the Armenians and the Kurds. So the Armenian delegation at the, at the uh, conference uh, at Luzon, they had one major aim. That was to be granted in an autonomous region within Turkey, either in Eastern Turkey or Northern Syria, where they would be, um, they would be living in what they called Armenian national home. It would be demilitarized area where the Armenians could practice self-rule and express their culture and their religion safely. Because remember, we're on the heels of the Armenian genocide during World War I, when the young Turks killed millions of Armenians, Assyrians, Greeks, uh, through mass killings and mass deportations, which inevitably resulted in, um, in death and destruction. And um, one, one thing to note is there was a big debate as to whether Armenia would be able to get granted this autonomous region at the, at the conference. But in, in, um, in light of some factors I'm about to describe, the Turkish leaders successfully rebuffed these proposals for an Armenian home within Turkey. And partly, or I would say, I would argue that the, the major reason was of the military success of Ataturk at the time and the bargaining power that they had militarily. But it wasn't just a lack of military leverage that the allies lacked. It might have been another factor is the lack of moral standing. So the Turkish press, they ran many stories about colonial misdeeds of the British and the French, especially in Africa and other colonies that they had, and even stories about the Ku Klux Klan in the US. They all were aiming to show that the allied powers themselves have mistreated minority groups. So who are they to school and educate the you know, Ottomans about their treatment of the, um, the minorities in their country, especially at a time when there was war. That was the Turkish uh, viewpoint. And they try to highlight the double standard of imperialism. And th that was successful. Between that factor and the military bargaining power of Turkey, uh, there was no justice for the Armenian genocide and the other Ottoman Empire crimes. There was no accountability for the perpetrators who committed these crimes against humanity. We don't know the actual source of that international law concept of crimes against humanity, but a lot of sources do point to the Ottoman um, genocide of Armenians as, as being a potential source of that, that concept. In fact, the Treaty of Lausanne doesn't even mention the Armenians once. And if you look at a provision in the treaty, it actually has an exculpation provision. So the signatories renounced all claims for the loss and damage suffered between August 1914 and the signing date of the treaty as a result of acts of war or measures of requisition, sequestration, disposal, or confiscation. Wow, that sounds like a blanket waiver. Basically, it was very convenient that they added this because it covers all the different crimes and damages associated with the genocide that they committed. So that, that to me was really tough to, to read that provision. And so Turkey's Armenian population became a minority group with mostly equal rights on paper, but they often faced discrimination in practice. Actually, one of the um, journalists, a French journalist, Ara Turanian, he uh, has said of the treaty that it was the crime of the century that came after the crime of the century, only accepting the Holocaust as an exception. But what he says is not only was there a genocide, but equally, if not more important, was that there was no justice, there was no accountability, there was no recourse or redress. Those are the two major uh, crimes against the Armenians and other minorities at the, um, at, at, at the behest of the, the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire. Now, I'll, I'll close this um, topic with the idea of self-determination. So not only are we dealing with the specific dynamics between the signatories of the treaty, we're also dealing with the international legal structure at the time. And at the time, there was this concept called self-determination. It was um, the, the main promoter was U.S. President Woodrow Wilson, who won the Nobel Peace Prize as the main architect of the League of Nations. And he promoted this idea that a nation, which is a group of people with similar political ambitions, can seek to create its own independent state. For the Armenians, the Kurds, and other minorities, 
self-determination was denied to them. And that is another lasting legacy of the Treaty of Lausanne, the failure to um, acknowledge and create accountability in the Ottoman Empire crimes and the successor state of uh, Turkey um, and the failure to have redress. Like all the confiscated property, all the, the destruction, the lives lost, everything was just swept under the rug by a single provision of the treaty. So with that powerful um, a thought, I, I leave you to that my, my thoughts have ended. <laughs> thank, thank, you, thank you, John. But what we should mention to the audience is um, part of the treaty related to, as was indicated earlier, the uh, Hellenic population or the Greek Orthodox population that could remain in uh, in Constantinople or Istanbul mm -hmm. and also on, on, on the islands. And then uh, what was mentioned also is the the Muslim population in uh, in Thrace. Mm -hmm. But but to the to the point of a solution. So it wasn't really a solution because uh, even after even after the signing of the treaty, Obviously, those those populations were ethnically cleansed mm -hmm. because um, in 1920, um, 1923, a third of the population, for example, of Istanbul was, in fact, uh, Greek Orthodox. And today, if you can find 10,000 Greek Orthodox in uh, Constantinople, it would be a lot. Whereas, whereas for example, the population in uh, Thrace and uh, Western uh, Western Thrace uh, has has uh, multiplied. Okay, mm -hmm. so so there are there are definitely issues in terms in terms of some of the issues that were mentioned, whether it was reparations or um, or um, you know things relating to genocide. Don't don't forget that uh, you know after the 1920 uh, Treaty of Cervez that that in fact uh, it was a different ball game and you know after after 1922 after 1922. So therefore. Some of the things that were in those in that particular treaty that would have addressed some of these issues uh, did not exist. I, I have to add also in, in terms of the genocide, you know, we mentioned the Armenian genocide, but during that period, there was also obviously the uh, Greek Orthodox uh, genocide as well as uh, as the Assyrian genocide. So uh, the Israeli professors on their thirty year uh, you know uh, thirty year genocide uh, eighteen ninety four. Uh, to 1924, you know, relate they they the way they looked at it is just the, the concept of uh, of of a Christian genocide. In other words, it was a genocide of, of, of all Christians. With that, thank you, and we'll come back to some of these issues. Uh, our um, our final presenter is uh, Peter Stavranidis. Uh, Dr. Stavranidis uh, is a frequent participant uh, speaker here with EMCA. Uh, he is a successful entrepreneur and has served in numerous uh, leadership positions within the uh, Hellenic American community, having, having held posts uh, that, uh, that related to Hellenic issues of the diaspora and the genocide uh, in Asia Minor and certainly in Pontus. Uh, this includes, uh, in, in his capacity as the past president of the Penn Pontian Federation of, of the U.S. and Canada, and being currently the president of the Federation of Hellenic Societies uh, in New Jersey. Peter occasionally teaches as an adjunct professor, uh, including at various institutions, but including also the Fashion Institute of Technology at SUNY. He is also a research associate at the uh, Pantheon University of Athens, the School of Social and Political Science. Uh, he has done extensive research in the evolution of Greek America, modern Hellenic history, and, and the Asia Minor genocide. He is currently conducting a postdoc on the Jews of Greece. He is an archon of the Order of St. Andrew, the Apostle, and on the Education Committee of the, of the Metropolis of uh, New Jersey. Welcome, uh, Peter, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you for this glorious introduction. Thank you so much. Uh, I, the, the last time uh, in recent years that the Lausanne Treaty topic uh, resurfaced itself was back in the 90s, especially with the EMEA crisis. And, and of course, lately, uh, we encounter uh, this treaty in the political language and diplomatic language, especially uh, between 
uh, the Greek and the uh, Turkish diplomats, diplomats, and, and of course the uh, the aspirations of the Turkish leader Erdogan and his revisionistic tendencies about uh, uh, the Lausanne Treaty. But to better understand the, the role and the significance of the treaty, it would be extremely important to consider the historical, geopolitical, uh, and economic state of affairs during that time period that these events are taking place. The Enlightenment has a great effect in the way of political thinking in Europe at the time, and especially the Balkans and somewhat the Ottoman Empire and the movement of the young Turks. So the Enlightenment is, is the moving force that caused the end of the empires, which were mostly multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multilingual, and they too become nation states. So the sense of nationalism can exist successfully only under unique characteristics. Homogeneity is the main ingredient and Greece, of course, was the first Balkan country to declare its independence and become a nation with the Protocol of London in 1830. Uh, let's start by mentioning that the Treaty of Lausanne annuls, voids, Akironi, the Treaty of the Serbs, which had been signed in August 1920 and which literally partitioned the Ottoman Empire, diminished it to a fraction of its original territory, and its signatories included the victorious allies of World War I and representatives of the Ottoman Empire, which, of course, at that juncture of history was at, at its uh, native. Uh, let me remind you that the collapse of the Greek army in the Anatolian front against the revolutionary ar army of Kemal Ataturk uh, took place either at the end of August or the beginning of September, depending on, on which calendar we're using. The collapse led to a chaotic retreat with unprecedented losses and, and, and a humiliating defeat, the worst without a doubt in the history of Hellenism. Uh, this massacre of the Greek army and the remaining Greek populations in Asia Minor came to an end with the intervention of Great Britain, France, and Italy and the details of an armistice after fierce deliber deliberations in Mudanya on September 1922, with Greece accepting it two days later after it was uh, determined. Uh, in the beginning, they refused to sign it because part of the agreement was for Greece to abandon Eastern Thrace. Although, demographically, the Greek population is more dominant in Eastern Thrace than the Western Thrace. So, Ismet Pasha, or Ismet Inonu, uh, arrives in Mudanya two days before the Greek uh, representatives and strikes a deal that uh, the whole eastern and western Thrace would go to Turkey. But of course, Greece uh, denied it, declined adamantly that, and, and but they had to agree for eastern Thrace to become 
part of the so-called Turkish Republic. So eventually they did sign. Why did they, they, they sign? Because Venizelos, as you mentioned before, the previous speakers, uh, he was a pragmatist. Uh, he didn't become emotional as other leaders, and that's why he was so likable. He was very likable by all the leaders, all the signatories, including Ismet Pasha and later Kemal Atatürk. So a month later, on November 20th, 1922, the deliberations for the Treaty of Lausanne commenced in the Swiss city of Lausanne. In these deliberations, which lasted till the conclusion of the treaty, uh, with a break, of course, uh, between February and April, uh, besides Turkey and Greece, of the other nations that participated were the following, Great Britain, France, Italy, Japan, Romania, and Serbia. The Soviet Union was invited to participate only during the discussion about the Dardanelles Straits, and Bulgaria was given the opportunity to discuss her situation vis-a-vis -vis access to the Aegean as well access to the Dardanelles Straits. The Lausanne Treaty was composed of, of 143 articles and was distributed over 17 documents. During the first part of the conference, from November 20th, 2022, till February 2023, the only topic that was covered was the exchange of the populations, which was, as was mentioned before, was the first compulsory exchange in the history based solely on religion. Now, why the, the Turkish representatives uh, were very adamant about the basis of the change of population uh, is, is, is the uh, identity of religion, not the ethnic identity or the language spoken by the populations. Now, uh, 1,650,000 Greek Orthodox Christians, not necessarily Grecophones, uh, were exchanged for about 650,000 uh, Muslims. And some, many of those Muslims didn't even speak the Turkish language. Most of them didn't either. And they didn't even have a Turkish uh, identity. But Turkey thought and saw that it would be much easier to jettison many more uh, populations, Christian populations, and that's what they managed to do. You see, they came from a point of being the winner, the winner of the, of the battle, uh, between the Greek, the Greek and the Turkish Revolutionary Army. The Lausanne Treaty is the equivalent to what is Greek Independence Day to Greece. So that said, the Lausanne Treaty is a treaty of defeat for Greece. The Treaty of Serbs was in accord with the Megali Idea creating the nation of Hellas, of the two continents and the five seas. So when it comes to Greek foreign policy, besides, of course, the US today, which is the main ally and world power, having taken that role from Great Britain after World War II, Greco-Turkish relations take the main stage since the establishment of the modern Greek nation in 1830. So some of the 
some of the details of deliberations, and of course we said compulsory exchange of populations, the first one and the last in the global history that such an event has taken place. The two countries, Greece and Turkey, could only come, let me, let me back, back for a second and say that almost everything that characterizes the Lausanne Treaty was agreed upon, always taking in consideration what is the benefits for the, the powers, the great powers at the time, especially Great Britain. Fortunately, if there was one country that was a little bit to our favor, was Great Britain, not France. And that had nothing to do that the French were not field Hellenes. But here, I want to add to the information of the previous speakers that France had lent tons of money to Turkey, to the Ottoman Empire. And at that particular point, a Turkey was on the verge of, uh, of economic collapse or bankruptcy. So one of the reasons uh, uh, that France uh, was on the side of Turkey in many of those issues because of this uh, issue. Now, what do we learn from the Lausanne Treaty? As I said before, it is a treaty of defeat for Greece in comparison to the Serb Treaty, which the, the Serb Treaty brought an unfounded, unfounded optimism, and which under the circumstances wasn't a realistic scenario. And on top of everything, it was a major contributing factor, bringing a sense of unity and nationalism between the opposing parties, to the opposing parties, the Kemalist revolutionary government and the Sultan's national government. We also must remember that Greece's campaign in Asia Minor started before the Serb Treaty had taken place, which makes this treaty immediately less powerful from its inception. In other words, it does not contain any mandate for Greece to disembark military force in Smyrna and proceed in Anatolia towards Ankara. It is a crucial document to study and learn from it for any contemporary Hellen and aspiring politician, especially in reference to how Greece should conduct itself in should conduct its internal and external politics, how to maintain a consistent and robust strategic policies, policy vis-a-vis -vis our allies and our occasional predators, especially our neighbor uh, from, the, from the East, Turkey. To understand the interest of our allies, especially the U.S., not the way we would like them to be, uh, because as I believe it was De Gaulle that had said many years ago, uh, in international politics, there are no friendships, there are only interests. Greece must have a respectable army which can defend swiftly and effectively any aggression from anywhere. An education that teaches history with its great and not so great moments. A patriotism that is necessary for a nation state. I, I don't mean to be nationalistic, but you can't have a nation state if there's no patriotism there. I'm sorry to say that, but again, it's a fact. And of course, that's another topic I don't want to deviate from today's topic. The Lausanne, the Lausanne Treaty is the end 
of the Megali there, but it's the beginning of a contemporary Greece that brings together and homogenizes its population. It generates gradually a strong ethnic identity, which also creates a Greece which becomes introverted and loses its cosmopolitanism as the well-known politician Evangelos Venizelos very eloquently discusses in one of his presentations. Because don't forget, we had Greeks, we had Greeks, uh, Greek Orthodox community in Smyrna, in Constantinople. So it gave uh, Hellenism this cosmopolitan character. The recognition that the modern Greek nation or kingdom at the time of its genesis is established and recognized as, I have to say, protectorate of the great powers. With the understanding and the obligation to contribute to the defense against any possible aggression from the North, either at the time from the Tsarist Russia, which later became the Soviet Union. And here, I want to say something about Eastern Thrace. One of the reasons why the Allies, especially Great Britain, supported the allocation of uh, Eastern Thrace to the Turkish Republic is this way. You can have in the Western Thrace, the Greek army and the Eastern Thrace, the Turkish army should, if there is an aggression from the North, especially the Soviet Union. The Lausanne Treaty is the final disintegration of the Ottoman Empire and the formation of the Turkish Republic which is a nation state. The treaty, though it clearly describes the influence and extent of the Ottoman Empire in the region that extends from the Balkan Peninsula, Asia Minor, the Caucasus, and basically all the Middle Eastern nations that emerged from its collapse. The treaty is not Greco-Turkish, is not Balkan, is not European. It involves every single one of today's geopolitical confrontations. And I'll mention a few. Nagorno, Karabakh, Libya, Iraq, Iran, Israel and Palestine, Cyprus, and all the disputes and revisionistic tendencies of Turkey vis-a-vis -vis the Aegean, the Muslim minority of Thrace, and last, and certainly not least, the Kurdish issue. What do we do with 40 million Kurds that are dispersed in at least three or four of these countries, most of them in Turkey? The Lausanne Treaty, by the way, does not allow for the formation of the, of the Kurdish nation. The Lausanne Treaty is alive and directly or indirectly in every major conflict and ge geopolitical confrontation in the Middle East. Yes, even in Europe, even in the U Ukraine conflict is connected to the Lausanne Free Treaty. And I finished my presentation here. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I will I will say a couple of things in terms of the population exchange and why the insistence, because you mentioned that, uh, Peter, there was an insistence yeah. uh, re relating to doing that. And a lot of it, a lot of it uh, had to do with um, philosophically what was taking place uh, within within Turkey itself and uh, the nationalistic tendencies of what uh, of what you had going on. And and one thing we we never we never mention or really talk about, but I like to talk about it on occasion, and and you'll hear the name you know that I, I constantly bring up when when we talk about that, which is basically uh, Ziga Gokalp, who's the grand what they call the grand master of Turkish nationalism, or the grand master of, of Turkism, and and that had to do with with basically creating a nation um, relate relating to uh, to Turks. OK, they didn't want they didn't want uh, other people. And and obviously they blamed some of these other populations. I mean, this is the Turkish, the Turkish, uh, uh, let's say, comment 
They blamed other populations for uh, being involved in the breakup of the Ottoman Empire. In other words, get rid of these people. Don't forget, even during even during the Hellenic Revolution or before or before the Hellenic Revolution, let's say in the in the seven, seven, uh, you know, seventeen seventies, where we had the Orlov Rebellion, one of the things that was was brought up to the Sultan, or the Sultan brought up actually, is let's exterminate, let's exterminate everybody in the Peloponnesus, and basically, and basically bring in uh, Muslims in the area. And told, you know, the Kapitan Pasha said to him, "Hey, who's going to pay the taxes if, if, if you do that type of thing?" So, the concept that, that those type of concepts were not new historically. I, I would I would like to and and in terms of the British and in terms I I like the comment by the way no friends just interests I like your comment I like your comment because in reality in reality I see I see uh, basically pawns by the great powers okay everyone's using using their pawns in order to do what what they want want to do it was mentioned before I think it was Nico mentioned uh, Kabul okay and the oil and the oil fields that that were that were there. Uh, there was a lot of things happening behind the scenes. Even though we have a treaty, I, I think this is a separate discussion. But I think we have to we have to jump into this again in the future and really start diving into diving into some of the issues that that we were talking about. I was fascinated by what Nico said that in fact some of the so-called memorandums that Venezuela's wrote uh, that fascinated me because because it almost implies. Correct me if I'm wrong, Nico. It almost implies that Venezuelans wanted to go into Smyrna and some of these other places that you were talking about. And I have to ask everybody the same question. Let me ask this question and just get your opinions on this. The war was not over on November 11th, 1918. Am I, am I wrong in this? This was a consequence. What took place eventually, which was the end of the war, was basically this treaty because the war was not over. Am I wrong on this? No, you're yeah. not wrong. If I may jump into yeah. the conversation. Yeah, please. No, please, please. Um, first of all, let's not forget that on, in November 1918, there was an armistice, yes. not uh, a conclusion of uh, hostilities. The end of the war was the Treaty of Versailles, as far as Germany was concerned, yeah. which was yeah. two years later. Yeah. As far as uh, the Balkans were concerned, uh, and the Ottomans in particular, that was the Treaty of Server in 1920, which was whole two years after the war. And the, that, the, let's remember that this was the last of the peace treaties that was signed because it was the most complex. And by the way, if I may add a few bits uh, in relation to uh, what uh, other speakers mentioned, uh, uh, the Treaty of Server didn't work because it was too complicated and it didn't settle any issue adequately. For example, Armenia, which was mentioned in the, compl the uh, complaints of Armenians, if I may use the term, in Lausanne, where Armenia had been written off really in 1920, despite President Wilson's uh, wish to create a counterbalance on the eastern side of Turkey along, uh, along the Greek counterbalance in Smyrna, which would be on the west side, to balance the, the Turkish nationalism. Armenia was in no position to do that. Armenians had uh, the area of Armenia had practically been depopulated because of the genocide. So the newly established Armenian state did not have the manpower to support the existence of the Armenian state. Moreover, because Kemal knew that, uh, only in a couple of months after the Treaty of Seven had managed to wipe out the uh, Armenian independence. I mean, even before the Greek election that uh, in November 1920 kicked Venezuela out of power, Armenians had been uh, forced to surrender on the harshest terms, which was exactly what uh, Kemal had ordered his general, Kemal, uh, Kazim Karabekir, who was in charge of that front, in, uh, enforcing them on the Armenians the harshest possible terms uh, so that they don't bother us anymore, they don't trouble us. And as if as that was not enough, of course, the Kemalists came um, to an understanding with the Soviets and they invaded Armenia at the same time. So they stabbed the Armenians in the back and they forced them, they established a new communist government, which negotiated the formal treaty uh, with uh, uh, Kemalist Turkey that uh, put uh, Armenia out of the game, if you, if you like. So that was why they didn't have any any 
chance in Lausanne, the Armenians. Uh, on some other issues, uh, if I may add, the minority rights in Turkey after 1923, which were guaranteed for um, non-Muslims, the remaining non-Muslims, not Greeks or Armenians, of course, but there were other smaller communities like the Jews, like the Catholics, uh, Catholic communities uh, that survived in many parts. The Turks didn't respect any of uh, that at all. There has been a book um, uh, in Greek, which will probably be published soon in uh, uh, in uh, English in America, because I've done the English translation of that, by Professor Theodosius Kyriakidis in Thessaloniki, which um, who has researched the Vatican archives on the Greek and Armenian genocide uh, in Anatolia. And he has uh, extended, ex uh, expanded uh, on that issue as late as the, 19, uh, the nine, nine, late 1920s. And he's proven by, through uh, documents and reports submitted by missionaries and Catholic priests in Turkey, that the Turks didn't uh, respect any of the commitments undertaken in Lausanne. They kept on putting pressure on the remaining uh, Christians, the Catholic, uh, for that matter, Catholic Christians, to get out of Turkey. Yeah. Uh, so that's another side effect of the uh, Lausanne Treaty. But can I, can, to, to, can I say uh, something? Yeah, before, yeah, go ahead, guys. If I may, here, yeah, this way we, we can change, you know. Uh, the, regarding the Armenian uh, issue, uh, the idea that was also to include, to have a, a mixed uh, country, a mixed nation with Armenians and Pontian Greeks, okay? So that that was part, but you see, Venizelos, as I said before, he was a pragmatist. Uh, he couldn't support a, a, such a solution, especially with the presence of the, the Greek uh, army, because it would be a tremendous, a huge front that they couldn't cover, and militarily was not. Uh, I mean, he made a, going back to the personality of Venizelos. Sometimes he had to make decisions. So he took political cause for that, especially in 1930 after after the Lausanne Treaty. He developed a friendship with Kemal Ataturk. Uh, he even recommended um, from the Nobel recommended Peace for, <laughs> for yes, and, and regarding about the reparations of the exchange in 1930, they came to an agreement and they finalized that we are even. Although you know, one million six hundred and fifty thousand Greeks that were mostly merchants, bankers, uh, business people. Uh, real estate owners vis-a-vis -vis the 650,000 Muslim population from Greece that were mostly agrotes, agri in agriculture. They were farmers, mostly. And, and another thing, another characteristic, but of course it's a different topic, but I have to mention it, that, that 650,000, very few of those that were ethnic Turks. There were either Greeks that uh, had, uh, uh, by force or by choice, if you will, become Muslim, or as part of the, you know, the Arvanites. That's another topic that maybe in the future we can discuss. Sometimes history doesn't want to touch that, but there were Christian Arvanites and Muslim Arvanites. So here, the Muslim Arvanites, they speak Greek, they have. A Greek identity, but they happen to be Muslim, you know. So all of them, or most of them, are transferred to Turkey. So these may I correct you? This the the Muslim Albanians, the Tamidis, were allowed by special arrangement to remain in Greece, and that's why I had the problem of uh, of their collaboration with the Axis. Yeah, the Nazis, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Then, yeah. But down, all of them, Nico, the rest of them, or the, the majority of them, against their volition, against their will, they were, they were, and they were not even ethnic Turks. Of course, you can say, if you look at Turkey today, how many are ethnic Turks? 
If you go to Istanbul, you're going to see uh, Turks with the bl blonde, blue eyes, uh, mostly Slavics, all right? Slavs that have been uh, either by force or by their own will become, we know that. So anyway, it was a strange situation. We know that. But at this time, the Lausanne Treaty supposedly ex expires at the end of the 100 years. And I no, think no, that, no, 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 I hold, think hold on, hold on. no, 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 politicians, and not, I'm not going to mention any political party, they leave that vague, it's uh, to them. Although nowhere in the articles, and I've read most of it, not all of it, most of it, it doesn't mention that after 100 years, it's, uh, it's the end. As long as there's peace, only if there's a war, only if there's another war, then probably another uh, after negotiation and deliberations. But since then, there was no war between Greece and Turkey. So nobody can say that it's it expires. That's yeah, what Stavro, I, yeah, that's Stavro, what Stavro, I meant to say. say. Stavro, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, so I want to fill in some some gaps because, you know, just to cover the Treaty of Luzon is a big issue in itself. So I just... I just skirted over it uh, in, a, in a general sense rather than going into a more uh, like that. For example, all the comments that were made are very good uh, and, and I appreciate your contributions. Now, for example, with the Treaty of Severus, um, Articles 66 to 83 cover the Smyrna provisions, but also one of the articles, please don't ask me the article offhand, actually said that the local inhabitants would have the right of union with, with Greece if they wanted it, through uh, yeah. the plebiscite yeah. organised through through the League of Nations. And also, to Australia signed the Treaty of Severus, by the way. Australia is one of the signatories uh, to, to that treaty. Now, coming fast forward to the elections of 1920, and, of course, when I see monkeys, I hate the damn things because <laughs> it was a monkey bite that caused <laughs> the, the defeat of Asia Minor. And the Australian Prime Minister, Billy Hughes, in the Imperial Conference in 1921, said so much treasure has been has been lost and all that over a monkey bite like that. He was pro-Turkish. He, he he didn't really like the Greeks, and, and of course, the, the French in particular took a hatred to Greece, not not, not because of they didn't like us, because of King Constantine, because of the events of December 1916, and and the French elephant never forgot that that that, that clash that was known as the Battle of, of Athens. Now, also, too, very quickly, um, uh, like that, and of course, we know the Treaty of Severus was, uh, was never ratified. Um, coming from, from an Australian British perspective, just after the fire of Smyrna, we have what's called the Chanak crisis. It nearly brought the, the British Empire into a new war with, uh, with Kamalis Turkey. The, the Turks wanted to pursue whatever remnants of the Greek army into Thrace, but the British took a stand at, uh, at Chanakale in the neutral zone that was part of the Treaty of Severus and says, you cross into the into Europe, that is war. And and then Lloyd George sent all these famous cablegrams to the Dominions, Canada, South Africa, New Zealand, Australia. The Australian and, and New Zealanders went by the barrel load to, to enlist to, to fight Johnny Turk as a, as is known here in Australia, but uh, but then of course uh, the the British cabinet said hey 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 let, let's step back a minute, and then then finally Harrington who was the commander in chief of the Allied forces in Constantinople in the end was able to calm the waters and and avoided a, a conflict. Then of course it opened the door then for the for the Mudanya uh, convention. Now, coming to, to the Luzon Conference, uh, like, for example, the Kurds were mentioned. Well, Ismit Pasha referred to them as mountain Turks. 
That's the term that he that he referred to them. And of course, the Kurds had a number of, of, of revolts during the 1920s and 30s, which were brutally put down. And one of the worst ones was at uh, Dershim, 1937-38. Uh, and you also have uh, someone mention about a, an Armenian homeland. I remember reading in the in the Near Eastern uh, thing in the British uh, p parliamentary paper, not one inch of Turkey will be ceded for an Armenian homeland. So so said the Turks. And uh, and I think Mr. Mr. Stavrianidis actually mentioned about Nagorno Karabakh. Well, we are seeing today over 120,000 uh, Armenians of uh, Nagorno Karabakh have been ethnically cleansed, and I hate that term. I really despise that term, have, have gone into Armenia. And the question is, if we hark back, say, to 1922-23, when the Greeks left Asia Minor, they could never return. Now, the question is, are the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh who are now in Armenia, will they will, will they be allowed? I don't think so. So we yeah. have parallels of 1922 with 2023 with the, with the issue of ethnic cleansing in Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, I, 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 I will say that the that the Kurds were used by the Turks to ethnic uh, cleanse the Armenians in what is now Turkish uh, Kurdish territory in Turkey itself. You know, starting in 1890, 1894, by the way. But anyway, I, I think we have to start wrapping this up. So what I want to do is just uh, have some um, last comments, thought processes, etc. And I'm going to start uh, again with Stavro. Your thoughts on uh, what we're talking about, and it, uh, it, you know, it, it it's really was was a great uh, forum. I think it was good to listen to other people uh, hearing what they had to offer, and I and I learned a few new things. And I and I think that that's the important thing is the exchange of ideas leads to more ideas, and and hopefully, uh, what what I said very early on is, is that we need a book that will try to write the history of the Luzon Conference, like the Paris Conference has been done to death. Maybe it's time that the Luzon Conference, you know, that a, that a, that a collection of us get, get together, put our minds together and work out themes that we can write about the, uh, like that. I'm actually planning to write an article on the reparations issue through the, through the, um, through the State Department collections and maybe also from the British collection as such. That, that's all I have to say. Stavra, thank, thank you for that. And I and I hope, uh, obviously, we continue this dialogue, because I think we have to come back to it and dive deeper into it. And Nico, some uh, final thoughts uh, for at least today's uh, panel discussion. Uh, thank you. I just want to uh, raise two minor issues which show why the uh, Anglo-Greek uh, agreements didn't work in the period uh, from the server to Lausanne. Um, and it's a significant reason why the whole thing collapsed for Greece. First of all, the server treaty was unrealistic, as one of our co panelists said, for other reasons, not just the military defeat of Greece. First of all, uh, Greece didn't get the loans that had been promised during the First World War uh, for the war um, effort. Uh, and the British were supposed, accor according to the treaty, to assist the Greek uh, military effort in uh, Anatolia. Instead of that, in 1920, when the British were involved in a minor civil war between the Kemalists and the pro-Sultan troops in Turkey, they asked for uh, Greek military assistance to settle the affair. So that shows how the whole thing turned around. And why Eastern Thrace was handed to Turkey, it's another issue which was raised, uh, because throughout the negotiations that had been taking place from 1921 to 1922 in the major European capitals, the uh, fate of Eastern Thrace was always connected to the outcome of the Greco-Turkish war in Anatolia. Whoever would win there would take Thrace as well. And in my opinion, that has to do with the fact that Eastern Thrace and uh, the San of Smyrna being held by Greeks helped uh, the English idea of keeping the Chanak uh, area, the Dardanelles, under British control. So the Greeks were the backup on either side. But if the Greeks failed, as they did in Asia and in Anatolia, there was no way they could keep Thrace because the English would need to have someone else to 
negotiate with. So I'll keep it there. There are plenty of issues, as you can see, that uh, arise as side uh, issues from uh, mm -hmm. this situation. And uh, <laughs> I wish you could vote. I, 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 I will. I will say that, like like uh, was stated before, that everybody thinks the, the major powers take care of themselves. I mean, part of the treaty, obviously, was they they. Uh, you know, they got Cyprus, for example, even though they had promised to Venizelos in the beginning, if, if they entered the war, that Cyprus would be would be Hellenic. Um, so there's a lot of things going on. John, some final thoughts and comments. Sure, I'll, I'll try to keep it very brief. I think pr President Erdogan said that the reason that the Treaty of Luzon has endured this long is that everybody has some reason to be unhappy about it. So something along those lines. With that, I think it was... Um, a very imperfect treaty, but it took, you know, it took, it, it took uh, a, a very complex problem and it, it tried to make a solution, right? And we, we are living with the consequences of that treaty to this day. Uh, query as to the merits of it, but today's panel, I think, was really humbling um, just to just to understand how little you know and how you're always uh, honing in on your knowledge and the complexity is just overwhelming of, the, of these topics and looking at everyone's contributions from their different perspectives um, was really inspiring because it, it shows that people want to learn from history, um, to understand the current events and to try to see if we can um, we can move on from here because the, the Treaty of Zon succeeded in not um, creating all out war between Greece and Turkey, but there is a constant tension and um, you know the, the, the imminency of, of war is around every corner. I mean, we've seen a few um, occasions the last few years that it's made clear that even though there's peace, there, there can be war that can break out at any moment. So how, how successful was the treaty in light of, of that? And, with, and that's a rhetorical question. And with that, th thanks so much, Lou, for organizing it. So all the, no, thank, all thank the you. Panelists. One of the things that we did not get into, and we'll try to do it in the future in more detail, is boundaries. Okay, national boundaries, national <laughs> waterways, and all the rest of that. I think that in itself uh, deserves a, a major a major discussion because major. a lot of the things that are taking place in the Eastern Mediterranean, including the the uh, obviously the oil and all the rest of that become part of this conversation. So we'll, we'll try to do that in, in the future in more, in more details. Th thank you, John. Uh, Peter, uh, some final thoughts? Uh... Well, the, the, the thoughts that come in mind uh, all these years that I've been studying this topic is, first of all, uh, the, the magnificent, the magnitude of the uh, personality of any zealous uh, how his personal charisma, which, which makes a difference. It makes a difference, you know, in human relations, in business, uh, in diplomatic relations, it makes a difference to have that charisma. But at the same time, uh, to be the chaos, uh, to be fair, I think we can say that Kemal Ataturk uh, was proven to be not only a tremendous uh, military man, but also a tremendous diplomat. Uh, now that's one. The second thing is, which I mentioned before, is how the Lausanne Treaty is connected, I would say most of the time directly to all the fronts, the geopolitical fronts that are taking place today, every single one of them, which, which is amazing. And, and that it gives me a segue to the third one, how crucial, because of the second point, how crucial it is for a, for a, a student of, of modern Greek history uh, to know about the Asian minor catastrophe and the Lausanne Treaty and all those things that we spoke about. And it's, it's unforgivable for an aspiring politician do not to master these. And I'm saying master. I'm not saying to know, to master. Because I am sure that the Turkish diplomats, especially the ones that conduct foreign policy, do master that and have the ability, when you master something, sometimes you have the ability to find loopholes. <laughs> Peter, 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 thank you for that, and I and, and I like your comment where I, you, you didn't imply this, 
But I just took it like that, that, you know, the Hellenic politicians uh, are lacking in many in many ways. And and, and in, so, in some ways, things that are, you know, just, you know, point blank a, a certain way, right. they sort of like uh, wiggle around like there's no point blank a certain way. And they're almost like negotiating against themselves. So so I, and I agree with you that that we are lacking in, in many ways uh, politically. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, whereas the other parties are very are very interesting and strategic, and and also very good at propaganda, by the way. Anyway, guys, you were fantastic. I think this is a topic that we have to uh, dive into a little bit deeper in the in the in the future. Certainly, we have to come back to it because there's a lot of issues that relate to this, including the boundary issues that we were talking about. And and the other thing, the other thing, Peter, uh, Peter, because you and I and many of us who are sitting here always have everyone yelling and screaming about different things. Uh, I'm talking about our community now uh, and, and really having no background or knowledge on some of these things that sometimes we talk about. OK, they don't even know the facts of some of these treaties and they and they just make arguments and just, you know, after a while you say, like, what's going on? These people don't know what they're talking about. So thank you again. We'll come back to this uh, to the audience. Thank you for being with us. And um and you're the best. Our next panel discussion is a little bit different because, you know, we like to do a lot of different things. So our next panel discussion will be in uh, in December. And it's going to be on the legacy of the Eastern dance. Now, the Eastern dance is what we call in, uh, let's say, America, maybe some other Western countries, belly dancing. So I'm, I'm going to have uh, experts on the Eastern dance because I think this is one art form that's ancient, that's ancient. Uh, and it's also goes back to, you know, when you go into the museum, I mean, what triggered my mind on this is uh, is a statuette in the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art, which has which is called the Veiled Dancer. And that was from 300 BC in Alexandria. And then you see some pottery also from that period. So the Eastern dance is a dance of the Mediterranean. It's, it's a dance that's also Hellenic. And we're going to dive into it with experts who have written books about it um in in december thank you again and uh we, and we will talk thanks guys thank you take bye. care bye, bye thank everyone. you